Thank you so much for, uh, to, for coming to this uh, incredibly special event. I'm very excited about this one. I don't know about you guys. Uh, just to introduce myself very quickly, uh, my name is Matt. I'm an astronomer here at the university. Um, we're very, very uh, honored and privileged to be here with Kayla Barron, uh, an astronaut who's going to be uh, answering some questions tonight. Uh, so just to in introduce Kayla very briefly, uh, Kayla was selected by NASA to join the 2017 astronaut class. Uh, she's a Washington native who graduated from, from the US Naval Academy with a bachelor's degree in systems engineering. Uh, she came to Cambridge as a Gates Scholar where she did her new, uh, master's degree in nuclear engineering. And then she was a submarine warfare officer and she was a member of the first class of women commissioned into the submarine community. Uh, she then served as a member of the NASA SpaceX Crew-3 mission to the International Space Station, which launched in November 2021 and uh, finally splashed down in May 2022 after 177 days in orbit. Um, Kayla is now preparing for NASA's Artemis missions, which are going to be heading back to the moon since, uh, for the first time since 1972. And uh, the Artemis missions would include the first time that a woman is ever going to walk on the moon, and Kayla is among those hoping to make history. So, um, Kayla, just to start off at the very beginning, um, how did you come to apply for NASA in the first place? You know, for me, it was a pretty long journey, supported by a whole range of mentors, supportive family, coaches, friends. Um, when I was a kid, um, this is a picture of me and my sisters, actually. I'm the one on the right, very early 90s look with the nerdy glasses and the feathered bangs that my mom trimmed for me. Um, but as a kid, when I was that age, I didn't know what I hoped to be when I grew up exactly. Uh, but I did have an incredibly supportive range of people around me who really encouraged me to develop my curiosity and chase my passions. And also to come to the realization that challenging yourself is important, but if you're doing things that, that are difficult, that you also love, that's where the real magic can happen. Um, and so that's how I started becoming interested in math and science, uh, continuing in sports as a kid and in college, and then eventually developed this strong desire to serve. And that's what took me to the United States Naval Academy for my undergraduate degree and ultimately drew me into the submarine warfare community. Um, and actually what brought me to Cambridge as well, you know, I, my interest in studying in graduate school was driven by a desire to tackle climate change and to look at new energy generation technologies that could help us tackle that problem. And being at Cambridge in this incredibly international, passionate, diverse community made me realize how many different and amazing things you could study and dedicate yourself to making the world a better place. So those kind of ideals are what drove me along the way, but it wasn't until after I had served on a submarine that I ever dreamed I could even become an astronaut. I was aware of the space program growing up, inspired by it, but I never pictured myself as somebody who could become an astronaut someday until I served in a very similar environment. Um, you know, for some people, they always imagine astronauts to come from the military aviation community. Nowadays, we have people from all different backgrounds and walks of life. But for me, the submarine force is the perfect analog for spaceflight because we're sending a group of human beings to live and work in a confined environment where human beings aren't evolved to be, whether that's the depths of the ocean or the vacuum of space. And so it was that experience, understanding all of the technological and operational solutions we needed to have people there in the first place, but very importantly, what kind of a team it would take to operate successfully in these incredibly complicated environments where you have to make quick decisions on limited information. Um, so that was a really important and formative experience for me that made me realize for the first time that maybe I had what it took to become an astronaut and gave me the confidence to apply. And so I applied and became an astronaut in 2017 with that training class. And five years on, I've been to space and back, and it's been an incredible journey already. It's absolutely fascinating. I would never think to make the connection between the submarine environments and the space environment, but of course, you're completely right. It's, there are so many parallels. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about the, the astronaut selection process? I mean, how, how do you go from someone who is just applying to going to space? 
We do an incredibly wide range of screening <laughs> during our selection process. Um, there's a really intense medical physical to make sure we're healthy. Uh, there's a lot of psychological um, evaluation to make sure we have the right personality and skill sets to train and fly in these extreme environments. And then once we get selected, we start training for things that are hard to imagine on Earth. So this photo actually shows how we train for spacewalks um, in the neutral buoyancy lab at Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. We actually put on real spacesuits, but practice underwater where a team of scuba divers helps us feel like we will feel in microgravity by keeping us neutrally buoyant in the water column. But that's only one of many things we have to train to do. Up in space, we have these small crews where the only thing we have to rely on there in person. And so we have to be jacks of all trades, masters of none. So in addition to that spacewalk training, we do things like learn how to operate the robotic arm, learn how to fix equipment if it breaks. We fly in T-38 training jets to practice making decisions and communication in a high-risk environment. We all learn to speak Russian because of our partnership with the Russian Space Agency aboard the space station. And we learn about the space station itself, the systems, how they're supposed to work when they're operating normally, and what we'll do in the event of an off nominal situation or emergency. And so all told, you do two years of training during your sort of basic astronaut training before you're even eligible for a mission. But once you're assigned to a specific mission, you train with that exact crew for two years before launch. And so you're practicing all of these different mission competencies and you can't practice for every single thing you're gonna encounter during a six month mission. There are things we just can't predict or expect. And so you have to sort of develop the foundational skills that you'll use in concert with support from the ground to tackle whatever challenge comes up each day aboard the space station. Amazing. Um, so at the start, I, I mentioned uh, that you're preparing for the Artemis uh, missions. Um, so can you maybe t uh, tell us a little bit about, about the Artemis missions that plan to return to the moon? Yes, it is an incredibly exciting time at NASA overall, but especially because of the Artemis program. We actually just this winter um, launched Artemis 1, which was the uncrewed test flight of the Orion space capsule aboard the Space Launch System rocket. I was actually there in person for this launch. It was the first launch I saw in person besides the one where I was on the top of the rocket and it took everyone's breath away. The Space Launch System rocket is the most powerful rocket ever built by humankind. And seeing it launch this capsule, although it's uncrewed this time, for all of us astronauts who were there to watch this launch in person, just imagining our friends and colleagues aboard that rocket for the next launch with Artemis II was incredible. So we're already underway with the Artemis program. Artemis II is set to launch in 2024. And Artemis 3, the next mission, is scheduled to land on the surface of the moon. So we'll be putting boots on the moon again. And unlike Apollo, we're going to be visiting new areas. We're planning to go to the lunar south pole in the first few missions. We're going to be establishing a long-term presence on the moon with things like habitats and rovers. Um, and this time, we're also building a station around the moon called the Gateway that will serve as a sort of an, a laboratory platform, but also a deep space outpost that we'll use to support not only lunar missions, but eventually missions to Mars. And we're doing this with an international community of partners, all who are bringing the best their country has to offer in terms of expertise, different space systems expertise, and even their astronaut cores will be part of these crews. And so it's a really exciting time to see what's coming up for Artemis. You are right. It, it is so exciting. I spent my whole childhood being obsessed by space, but lunar exploration, exploration was always something that we looked back on that happened in the past. And knowing that we have uh, lunar exploration and Martian exploration coming up in the future, it's, it is such an exciting time. Um, just a bit more on the Artemis missions. Can you talk a little bit about how the crew for the lunar missions might be selected? I imagine there's a lot of thoughts at NASA right now putting it, uh, going into that. We're all getting basic training in geology that we'll build on once we get assigned, especially to a surface mission. But all of these upcoming flights are really test flights in a lot of ways. We're gonna be operating equipment for the first time. We're gonna be sending crew further away from earth than they've ever been before. And so we're really trying to be involved in the development of these systems, whether that's the spacesuit we'll wear on a moonwalk or the lunar lander that will fly from orbit around the moon down to the surface and then back off the surface of the moon to meet our reentry vehicle. All of these systems are gonna be tested for the first time in these upcoming missions. 
So a lot of the objectives will be just checking out all of the systems, trying to understand how they're working nominally, and then test out any emergency or off nominal capabilities. But once we get to the surface of the moon, it's all about the science. We're really excited about the lunar geology studies we're going to be a part of. There's a lot we still don't know about the moon. And it's not just about understanding the moon. The moon can tell us a lot about how the Earth and our solar system were formed, the early history of our solar system. Uh, so it's an incredible opportunity to learn more from a planetary science perspective. And then there's a ton of opportunities, especially on Gateway, to do some incredible physics research, foundational physics research, astrophysics. Um, so the possibilities are really endless, and we're really excited to see what the scientific community will bring to these platforms once they exist. Um, it's, it's such an incredible thought that uh, within a few years, we'll be doing scientific experiments on the surface of the moon again. Um, so just a bit, bit, a bit more of a philosophical question, uh, just for you personally, what would it mean uh, to be the first woman on the moon? You know, for me, sending a woman to the moon, but also just more diverse crews generally than we saw in Apollo, is really kind of a visible representation of the incredible legacy that's made the space program so strong. Women have been flying and contributing in space and on the ground to the space program for decades. Since the space program started, women have been involved in it. So to us, it only makes sense that, of course, that those crews will include a more diverse representation of our astronaut corps, of our nation, and of the world. And so it will be this momentous occasion, you know, to send a woman to the moon, to walk on the moon for the first time. But to those of us in the business who show up every day and work with this really diverse team, it's just kind of cementing that legacy and honoring the people who came before us who blazed those trails so that we can be here talking to you today at all. Amazing. Um, so bringing it back down to earth a little bit, can you talk a little bit maybe about how your master's degree at Cambridge uh, sort of helped prepare you for, for what you're doing now? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I rely on the skills I learned in my education all of the time in my job as an astronaut. But I think in particular for me as an engineer, both um, as a control systems and robotics engineer in my undergraduate degree, and then a nuclear engineer, in my graduate degree at Cambridge, it really taught me how to look at super complex problems, break them down to their fundamental parts and questions, and really determine what was important and what was not, and then work through some trial and error solution decision making, and really learning from each of these iterative challenges and mistakes to come up with a better solution next time. And it also taught me how to work on complex problems with a team, you know, working with my research team at Cambridge or on my undergraduate research. It was always incredible to me the power of bringing in different perspectives. You can really get in the weeds <laughs> looking at a complex research topic and need somebody with a fresh set of eyes to just say, hey, have you thought about this? Or maybe you could think about this problem differently. And we do that all the time in space. We're constantly encountering problems. And sometimes you can sort of get stuck in one way of thinking. And so bringing in different perspectives to help you solve a problem is really powerful. Um, so I think all of those communication skills, thinking skills, teamwork skills that I practiced in my research programs really helped me in my day-to-day -day life as an astronaut. Absolutely. It's something that you see all through science and tech and engineering, isn't it? It's becoming such a, a sort of massive collaborative affair. Um, it's, yeah, it's wonderful to see. Um, can you talk maybe a little bit more about your, your time on a nuclear submarine um, and maybe how that helped you in your, your current work? Yeah, absolutely. I think most of all, as I mentioned earlier, the most important thing was understanding how to work as a team in these really high risk, complex environments. Um, as a young junior officer, my first tour aboard the submarine, I was doing things like basically driving the submarine, running the whole submarine wall <laughs> on watch. We call it officer of the deck. You're the representative of the captain. Sometimes while everyone more senior than you with more experiences is, is sleeping and you're trying to make a decision in this really complex dynamic environment, submarines, just like spacecraft are always in motion. And so you always, it, everything's changing. And so I think for me, I really learned the power of how to bring people with different perspectives, different objectives together to make decisions that work well for everybody. Everything's a compromise in these operational environments. You can't always meet all of the objectives in the perfect way. So you have to make a decision that supports all of the varying 
you know, stakeholders and you have to do that quickly in these environments too, because you don't have a lot of time sometimes to make these decisions. Um, and so for me, I think it was a way of operationalizing those same skills that I talked about learning in academic environments out in the real world where there are really serious consequences for what you're, what you're thinking, doing and saying. And so that was kind of, that built on those same skill sets, allowed me to put them into practice when there's a lot on the line. And I think I continued to build on those when I came to NASA. Okay, I've, I've got a question that I've always wanted to ask an astronauts. Um, what, what's it actually like being launched into space? Can you maybe try and put that into some words that as uh, non-astronauts might understand? Yeah, you know, it, in many ways, it's a sort of an indescribable experience. During our training, we try to break down every part of that experience to help us understand what it's going to be like to actually be on top of that rocket launching into space. So everything from centrifuge training to try to understand what it's going to feel like, the G-forces on our body, um, to what the vehicle will sound like, all the procedures that we run in a nominal situation or if something goes wrong during launch. But what they can't really simulate is what it's going to feel like emotionally. <laughs> you know, you're, you're on top of a giant bomb <laughs> launching to space. It's a really incredible experience, but we were just so prepared that we were just following our procedures, following our checklists. But when the booster finally lit underneath us and the rocket started to lift off the pad, but we weren't quite accelerating yet, you sort of hang there in this moment of like, we're truly finally going to space. And for me, I was just hit with the purest emotion I've ever felt of joy and excitement that I was finally going on this incredible adventure after so much preparation. Um, and so it was really just a beautiful experience. Um, and we were so excited once we got up there and finally arrived at the space station to join the rest of our crew. You, you make that sound absolutely amazing. I think as someone that doesn't even like roller coasters, I think I would be terrible at this. See, like you make it sound like an amazing experience. Um, so you mentioned science experiments um, on the surface of the moon. Am I right in thinking that you do science experiment on the space station as well? Absolutely. You know, that's actually the mission of the space station is we are a laboratory in low Earth orbit and we provide this really unique microgravity laboratory platform. So during our six month mission, our crew executed over 300 different scientific investigations and technology demonstrations. This photo shows me with a free flying autonomous robot called an Astro Bee. I think if I can tell right, that might be Queen Bee. Um, but also has the, her sister bees, honey bee, up there with her. But she basically, we're training these autonomous robots to do different tasks in space. And we're going to be using robots on the surface of the moon to support what we're doing as well. So it's an interesting technology demonstration to understand how you can take the best of robotics technology and the best of having a human being on site to work together. But we're also doing things that lead to new medical innovations, new medications for various illnesses. Um, we're growing plants in space, trying to understand not only foundational research about how plants grow, how we, how we can create drought resistant plants on earth, but also how we might farm essentially in the future, either on a vehicle or on the surface of another planetary body. We are the experiment in many cases. So we will actually, we give all of our different bodily fluids, everything you can imagine to science while we're up there. They're studying radiation exposure, how our bodies adapt to microgravity. So there's an incredible and diverse range of scientific experiments that we're helping execute during our missions. Well, what was your favorite experiment, if, if it was one that you haven't mentioned yet? You know, one of the coolest ones I got to participate in is um, they flew up during our mission and we got to install a miniature scanning electron microscope called a mochi. Um, I remember in my undergraduate research, I used a scanning electron microscope as part of what I was doing that was the size of a cubicle in an office. And this was like, you know, just this tiny little thing that had this incredible imaging technology. And they actually sent up samples of a Martian asteroid for us to image from space. Um, but you can imagine using this in so many different ways, especially for in situ observations on a planetary body, because one of the things we'll really be limited on is our scientific equipment in the field, uh, either on the moon or on Mars. We can't compare at all to state the our laboratories on Earth and what they're capable of. We're still understanding what we can learn from the Apollo samples today as new technology is developed. 
And so we were imagining, you know, what would it be like if we could actually image samples with a scanning electron microscope so that geologists and planetary scientists on the ground could look at those samples and decide which are the most interesting ones to bring back. Have they seen something like that before? Or is there something totally new? Um, and so that was really cool in terms of technology demonstration because that is the size and mass of something that we could actually take with us and make part of a planetary lunar laboratory. Um, so we were really excited about that one. So 177 days in orbit seems, at least to me, like an enormous amount of time to spend in space. Can you talk a little bit about your day-to-day -day life uh, up on the space station? Yeah, it, it's a really cool existence, actually. Our normal work day starts at 7.30 in the morning with a planning conference with all of the uh, stations around the world, the mission control centers that support what we're doing that day. So usually we're up between 6 and 6.30, eating breakfast, preparing for the day. And then the workday formally kicks off at 7.30 in the morning. And then from 7.30 in the morning to 7.30 at night, we are scheduled down to five minute increments. Our time is, you know, crew time is the most limiting resource aboard the space station. So we are executing science experiments, doing maintenance, on all of our different systems, but we're also living a day-to-day -day life. So this actually shows me after I wrapped all the Christmas presents for my crewmates, we were up there for uh, Thanksgiving and for Christmas uh, for a couple of members of the crew's birthdays. Um, so we're not just working up there, we're living together. Um, so we have family dinners and movie nights. Um, like you said, six months is a long time. And so we work really hard um, while we're up there, but we also have a lot of fun. So just random question. So you said you get up at 7.30. What, what time zone is the space station on? Like, how do you define 7.30 in space? That is an excellent question. So we're actually on Greenwich Mean Time, the same time zone you guys are in, which is a good kind of middle ground for all of the control centers around the world, whether that's Houston, where NASA's mission control is, or in Japan, Canada, Europe, Russia, um, so we kind of split the difference. So in the control centers all around the world, they're on a 24 hour watch rotation. So eight hours at a time, people come in um, to crew the mission control centers, experts from each of the major systems. So they're always monitoring the space station from the ground. They're part of our crew too. And then aboard the space station, we're on a norm, sort of normal circadian rhythm schedule. We all work and sleep at the same time on Greenwich Mean Time. Do you find it hard to maintain the circadian rhythm with them? Um, because the space station goes around once every 90 minutes, if I'm right. So you're seeing is it 16 sunrises and sunsets every day. Um, is, is it hard to yeah. maintain your normal sleep cycle <laughs> under that environment? Yeah, you know, it can kind of become a weird, timeless uh, space because there are windows, of course. You go out and you could be seeing any time of day. We could be on the in eclipse or on the dark side of the Earth where it looks like night outside or on the sunlit side of the earth, seeing different, whatever part of the earth um, is lit at the time. Um, so we're not really connected with sunrises and sunsets where, but our bodies are still programmed to be on a 24 hour clock, even without that input. So we, we do things ritualistically as a crew to kind of help reinforce that. Um, the lights have different settings. So they have like a bright blue light to help wake you up in the morning and then kind of a regular tone and then a warm, um, like no, no blue light kind of amber tone in the evening that kind of mimics the sunset. So we always adjust to the lights um, to help our, our bodies kind of be encouraged into that cycle. But your day is anchored around things like meals and exercise as well. So you kind of get in, into a rhythm, um, but it can also be hard being in a different time zone from your family and friends. So when you're trying to stay in touch with people, um, that can be a bit of a challenge, just like, you know, for you trying to talk to your friends in other parts of Europe or maybe in the States. Um, it's something you always have to have to think about as you go, go about your day. Yeah, absolutely. On that note, could you maybe talk a little bit about some of the things you found challenging spending six months in space? It must have been extraordinarily difficult in lots of ways. Yeah, you know, I think for most of us, it is that disconnection from your your family back at home. Um, trying to keep up with everything that's going on in the planet when you also have your own little existence in space that's really hard to relate to or fully imagine unless you're there at the same time. Um, you know, even other astronauts who are back on Earth can't really relate directly to what you're going through that, that day because you might be under different stressors or have different things going on your, on your mission than they did. Um, so trying to really share that experience with the people that you care about 
help them feel connected with what you're doing while at the same time keeping up with your, you know, all the regular <laughs> goings on with life and your family, people you care about on earth um, when you're doing something totally different. Um, so that that's a big challenge is being away from home, but we also get very close as crews. You kind of have your space family, your space brothers and sisters up there with you. Um, so I think for all of us, that's who we turn to for support first because they're there with you experiencing the same things, the same joys, the same challenges. Um, and so in some ways, the, that challenge of being disconnected from your family back home creates this really beautiful opportunity to form new relationships and different kinds of relationships with your crewmates on orbit. Oh, that's very beautifully put. Um, how, how did the reality of being in space differ from what you maybe expected when you're going through your training? You know, I think we spend a lot of time thinking about the technical aspects and challenges, the operational challenges. Once you get there, you realize what an incredible emotional experience it is to work in this environment, be the representative of such an incredible team, thousands of people on the ground who are supporting what you're doing at any individual moment. Um, but I think also you can't really prepare for, or you don't really expect how much seeing the earth from the perspective of orbiting around the earth can change you. Um, seeing it that with your own human eyes, looking out the window, this is me with binoculars actually looking at the moon. Um, that's like a little dot off there in the distance, but looks huge from um, in person when you look out the window. Um, I think for me, that experience of seeing our planet in a different way than you see it on the maps in school with all of the borders and the countries delineated so carefully, from orbit, you see the Earth as a connected biosphere. You know, you see this thin line of the atmosphere that's the only thing separating our planet from outer space. You see how the planet is just one giant organisms full of organisms. Um, and so it's just an incredibly humbling experience. I think it makes most of us feel very small at first. Um, but for me, it made me realize and recommit to making the planet a better place with the tiny blip in time I have on the planet. Um, and so I think seeing what we can accomplish when we come together, overcome our differences, work together as an international community, and all of the incredible benefits for humanity we are able to provide from our work aboard the space station, just, you know, you bring that back with you and start seeing the world in a different place. Like, what if we were working together on these challenges instead of at cross purposes? You, you hear this from, from so many people that have seen the Earth from outside. It does genuinely seem to profoundly change people, right? It makes me feel, I don't know, I wish more people could have that experience. Um, can you, how, I do too. It, it would, I wish I could take you all with me, even if it was just for, you know, a few moments to get to see the Earth from that perspective. It's incredible. What was it like coming back? How was the return from orbit? You know, it was really challenging, actually. So we all actually really enjoyed reentry on our crew. Um, you spend a lot of time thinking about and simulating launch. Um, and it, it felt about how we expected it to, you know, all that thrust underneath you propelling you into space. Um, reentry, you really have this visceral feeling. I am falling from space, hurtling back to the planet. It's, it's just this crazy you know, the heat shield's oriented towards the atmosphere. You see the plasma glow and the pieces of the heat shield sublimating off. You reach this incredible G-loading, you know, four, four and a half Gs on your chest. It's like kind of crazy as you're, you're accelerating. Um, and then eventually the parachutes deploy and slow you down really abruptly. Um, it's just a really wild ride and we had a lot of fun. Um, but then once you land, it's a tough transition. So we're actually all in really good shape. We work out seven days a week aboard the space station, lifting weights and doing cardio exercise. So we're strong and we're in good cardiovascular shape, but our neurovestibular systems are so out of whack. Our inner ear sensors that tell your body how to balance, how it's oriented in space. It's the way you can stay standing up. If you close your eyes, you're not going to fall over. But for us, when we got back, we can barely walk on our own unsupported and you can't really, if you're in a straight line, maybe you're okay, but you turn a corner, you can get vertigo. Um, just while your brain kind of rewires and remaps to the signals of gravity. 
Um, so it takes a few days until you kind of feel like you're back on your feet and then a couple of weeks before you're able to resume normal activities like driving. Um, so it, it's a big adjustment period um, when you come home. And I think it's also an emotional adjustment period because you're reintegrating into your normal life. All of a sudden you're getting social media alerts on your phone that you haven't had for six months. Um, you're back at home with your family when a week ago you were in outer space. Um, and for me, I wasn't quite ready to leave. We had so much fun every day aboard the space station. Our crew was really close. Um, and so just the end of, it was kind of an end of an era too. Um, so it's a big adjustment coming back to the planet. Um, okay, I'm gonna ask a question which I, I suspect I know the answer to, but I want to hear um, what your thoughts. Um, so space travel and space, everything you do is very expensive. Um, do, you, do you feel it's worth it? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's not a surprising ask, answer coming from an astronaut, but the space program since its inception has resulted in so many science and technological innovations that we rely on on Earth. There's so many re ways our lives are better because of what we do in the space program. But most of all, when, when I hear questions about whether it's worth it to send human beings to space. I always want to take the person asking that question with me to an elementary school to talk to, you know, school aged children and see how their eyes light up when they see these videos and photos of the things we're doing in space and the creativity it sparks. Not necessarily always that they want to become an astronaut, but that anything is possible if you work hard and follow your dreams, if you really dream big. Um, and so the value of that to me is just immeasurable. And I think, especially when we start returning to the moon and doing some amazing things, we'll see that, you know, exponentially grow that, that ability to inspire people around the world. So th thinking about talking to young people in school, what, what advice would you give to young people that want to become astronauts? I think there are a lot of young people that want to become astronauts. It's gotta be one of the top, uh, top dream jobs. Uh, what, what advice would you give to a 10 year old who is, is desperate to do your job? I mean, the first thing I would say is astronauts are just regular people who have worked hard and that have gotten incredibly lucky to get this opportunity. Um, and so I think the most important thing is not to never to limit yourself, never to close a door on yourself. I know for me, every time I had a new big dream, there's always this little voice in the back of your head. Like, can you really do that? Do you really have what it takes? And if you let that voice be, become too powerful, you'll hold yourself back. And I was lucky that I had incredible mentors at each of those critical moments who, who gave me a little push and said, you have to at least try. You how do you become an astronaut? You apply. You have to put yourself out there. Um, it's not as complicated as you can sometimes make it feel. So whatever your dream is to be an astronaut or anything else, just Focus on the things you're passionate about, work hard, and never close the door on yourself. Amazing. Well, so I've been asking quite a lot of questions. I wonder if it's a good time to uh, turn things over to the audience. Uh, is there anyone out there that has a, a question for Kayla? Since uh, all of the um, technology has advanced, how long will it now take to reach the moon? You know, it only takes about three days to get to the moon from Earth, which is kind of amazing if you think about it. I just drove from Houston to Washington, D.C., and it took me four days. So you can get to the moon faster than that, which is amazing, even though it's 250,000 miles away. Uh, so that's really incredible. And one of the things we think about when we go to the moon, and one of the reasons we want to return to the moon, is it's so much closer than other planetary body bodies like Mars. And so we're actually using the moon as a testing ground, a proving ground for all of the technology we're going to need when we want to send human beings on the next giant leap all the way to Mars. And so Mars, we think right now with current technology, it would take about six months to get there if you wait until the ideal planetary alignment. So when Earth and Mars are close to each other in, in their relative orbits. Um, so we're going to use this opportunity to go not far from home, only three days, to learn how to do that well before we take the next giant and much longer trip to Mars. Hello, my name's Heather. Um, I've seen in our media at home that um, a new space suit is being developed. There were some pictures of it. It was a dark material, not the white ones we're familiar with. Do you, do you know about those? Can you tell us anything about them? 
Yeah, of course. Actually, one of my jobs right now is I'm helping develop all of the systems that will send to the surface of the moon, including the spacesuits. So we actually have two contractors who are developing spacesuits for planetary exploration. Um, one, the one you mentioned that got announced last week, um, the Axiom spacesuit. Um, they're kind of they have this you know this kind of overlayer that looks all jazzy with the black and <laughs> and navy and orange stripes. Um, looks very cool on Earth. When we take it to the moon, it will actually have a cover layer that's white, uh, provides better thermal protection um, and reflectivity. Um, so eventually, the crew it'll look a little bit different, but. Um, these suits are advancing everything we've learned from Apollo, from the space station, uh, to better improve our suits for planetary exploration. So the suits we use on the space station, you don't actually have to be able to walk in them because you're in microgravity. We propel ourselves using our arms and hands. But when we're back on the surface of the moon, not only do we have to walk, we have to be able to do things like kneel down and stand back up, be able to get up if we fall over. So these suits actually weigh hundreds of pounds. Um, and so on the moon, even though we're in one six gravity, it'll still be pretty heavy, but they can be awkward to operate in because they have to be pressurized above vacuum pressure because there's no atmosphere on the moon. So they'll be operating at probably 4.3 pounds atmospheric and delta pressure in this case. And so you're always fighting against the pressurization of the suit. Even closing your hand is a lot of work because you're working against that five pounds of resistance. And so doing things like recovering from a fall, or if we, for some reason, had to help rescue a spacewalk partner or something like that, these suits have to be really capable of not only keeping us alive, providing life support for nominal situations, but also anything that could go wrong along the way. And so those teams are solving a lot of really complex challenges, doing things like figuring out how to get us water and hopefully some sort of caloric nutrition when we're out there <laughs> on an eight hour moon hike doing hard geology training and things like that. So it's it's some really cool technology and we're excited to see those prototypes get announced. Um, if you go like outside in the actual part of space, how do you like get around? Because otherwise you'll just float in places you don't really want to go. It's an incredibly big challenge and we spend hundreds of hours training before we on earth before we do it in space. Um, but in microgravity, when, on, like we are in, in the space station, when we do spacewalks, um, we actually use our hands and there's kind of these rails or handles called handrails that we grab to pull our body along. But you're right that you could just go floating off into space and that would be very scary. So we have a thing called a safety tether. Um, it's a steel cable that's on this retractable reel. So when we come outside the airlock, we lock a hook down, kind of like if you were rock climbing. Um, so you have a rope, a retractable tether that will pull you back to the airlock if for some reason you let go by accident. But we also have shorter tethers that hold us near our work site. So if, I, if we're not moving around, if we stop, we attach one of those so we can never get too far away from the space station itself. And then we have a whole range of tools that help keep us in the right place while we're doing our work. Um, have you ever seen the solar system before? So when we are in low Earth orbit aboard the space station, we're actually only 250 miles above the surface of the Earth. So the perspective is not that different for, for us from if you just go outside at night, especially if you're out in the countryside where there's not a lot of light pollution and you can see the galaxies, you know, the the Milky Way, all of those stars. What's a little different is we're not looking through the Earth's atmosphere. So stars don't twinkle the same way because there's nothing uh, interfering with that light. The moon looks bigger and looks really three-dimensional. So you can see that it's really a sphere. It doesn't look kind of like a flat circle in the sky. Um, and we get to see some incredible incredible phenomenon back on Earth, like the Northern Lights or Southern Lights, Aurora. So those bright green lights you see photos of um, at the in the Arctic, um, very beautiful. Some We see a lot of shooting stars, lightning storms are amazing from space. Um, so our perspective is not that different from what you see on Earth, but I think everything's just a little bit more dramatic when you're looking out the window from a spacecraft. Yeah, so the question was, um, sorry, I, if I heard it right, it was the, the, space, the, the space station might get decommissioned at one point. 
Um, is, is that likely to happen? And how do you feel about that? So the space station was originally designed to operate not nearly as long as it already has. So we've already extended the lifetime of the space station several times. And NASA is now committed through 2030. We were originally supposed to decommission it in 2024, but NASA's decided that we wanna continue at least through 2030. So the space station, we've been able to keep it running and upgrade it appropriately over the years so that we think it's still a really valuable platform to keep. Uh, but eventually the, the systems will just get old. It'll be time to replace them with new technology. And there are a lot of commercial companies who are actually planning to build stations in low earth orbit and operate them privately. Now at the same time for NASA, when we think about the future of space stations and what will happen when the International Space Station is decommissioned is we are focused on building a new station called Gateway that will actually be in orbit around the moon. So we're gonna build a deep space space station and use that as a laboratory, as a way to get to and from the surface of the moon and eventually as an outpost where astronauts will stop, stop on their way to Mars. And so we're really excited about taking everything we've learned from low earth orbit operations and taking those into lunar orbit. And it is the plan that the Gateway uh, Station will be just crewed permanently in the, in the way that the ISS is? So right now we're envisioning it as not continuously crewed, but we'll send crews probably for weeks or months at a time. And when they're not there, a lot of the systems like the life support systems will be dormant, but we'll be able to talk to it from the ground and continue scientific experiments and things like that. So it'll always be on standby and ready to receive a crew, but we won't necessarily always have a crew there. Uh, are you concerned about the situation of space debris possibly interfering with our operations and possibly locking us in the air? Uh, space debris is definitely a big and growing challenge. Um, just like we've seen in many different situations on Earth, managing these you know, places like international waters where trash has been dumped and now that all of a sudden we have these huge problems. As satellites get retired, they just turn into trash essentially in orbit around the earth. Um, so there's everything from tiny micrometeorites to really big uh, things in orbit, some of which are operating and functional and some of which are basically just floating out there dead in space. Um, so it is a really big challenge right now. Um, we partner with the US Air Force and Space Force for understanding what's in orbit around the Earth and they give us warnings if anything will come and interfere with the orbit of the space station. And sometimes we actually move the space station out of the way to prevent a potential collision with other objects. Um, and I was actually up there a few days into our mission, there was an anti-satellite mission te test launched from Russia and it created this huge new debris cloud. Um, we didn't know that it was gonna happen, so it was unexpected, and we ended up sheltering in place and thought we might even evacuate the space station as a result of not understanding this debris cloud. Luckily, the, the teams on the ground and across the world were able to work together to ensure that we were safe and were able to continue operations. But it's only gonna become more and more complicated, so I think we need to figure out how we're gonna regulate things in space, how we're gonna make sure that debris is responsibly handled and disposed of, that there are deorbit plans for this equipment so that it doesn't just stay up there. Um, so it's definitely a growing challenge and I think it's one that needs a lot of international cooperation and attention um, in order for us to manage carefully over the coming years and decades. How long would it take to get to Mars from Earth? So right now with the technology that we expect to be available either sort of today or the next decade or so, we expect that it'll take about six months to do a one-way journey from Earth to Mars or back. And that also relies on the need for the planets to be in the right orientation. So as Mars circles the sun and Earth circles the sun on its different orbits, sometimes we're pretty close, the planets pass pretty close together, and sometimes we're really far away. And so we try to maximize the efficiency of that journey by choosing a time to launch the vehicle when Mars is pretty close to the Earth. It makes it kind of incredible. So the, the person on the mission to Mars is going to be a year in transit there and back, plus the time they spend on the Martian surface. What's the longest someone has ever been in space for? Because presumably the person that goes to Mars is going to, is going to break that record. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. That'll definitely be a record breaking mission. Um, our standard missions aboard the space station are six months, but we have had several crew members of multiple nationalities stay for around a year. Um, and so we have pretty good data on how the human body responds and adapts to a space environment over six months, but we really want to understand how those effects will transform over a longer time frame. So can we kind of plot them and understand the trajectories of different effects like bone density loss and things like that past six months? The only way we're going to figure out if our models are correct is by doing some real testing. Um, so I was up there with Mark Vandehei, who has the record for longest continuous American space flight at 355 days. Um, so yeah, that's something that we're using the space station yet again as a platform to help us understand what we need to be able to do to do these exploration missions in the future. It sounds like going to the ISS is a hugely exhilarating experience, but I just wondered if you had any moments where you were fearful and then how you overcame them. Yeah, you know, we train for every expected situation and for every unexpected situation we can ima imagine in advance. Um, and we get used to the idea that we can't be totally prepared for it for everything. So we're kind of preparing for the things you can't prepare for as well. Um, so by the time we get to launch day and we're actually up there in orbit, even when unexpected things or off nominal things happen, we really rely back on our training, not only our technical training, but really the trust we built in our team and our crew on orbit, but the mission control teams on the ground. So whenever we were responding to something, especially if it was unexpected, I really felt like we could have been back in the training environment because we've done that so many times, you know, practiced. What if there was a fire on the space station? What if there was a hole in the space station? It was depressurizing. All of these really extreme situations we practice. So at all the scenarios we faced in real life up there in space, uh, we felt really prepared to handle those and tackle those challenges. So sometimes in hindsight, you look back and you go, wow, that was a really challenging situation, tough day. Things got sort of uh, Harry there for a little while, but in the moment, you really, I think, are responding in a way you've been conditioned to respond through really excellent training on the ground. So I don't think I ever felt like fearful in the moment. There are definitely things where you're, you're at a sort of a heightened awareness is how I would describe it. Certainly um, on my first spacewalk, for example. Um, when you look out the window of a spacecraft, it's incredible, but there's something different about looking out the visor of your helmet. There's nothing in your peripheral vision, and you really have this sense you're like out in the vacuum, inky blackness of space. And when you can see the Earth, when the Earth is lit beneath you, we're traveling at 17,500 miles per hour. It's just incredible to look down and, and see the sense of the planet. Wrote, you know, we're just hurtling around the planet at this incredible speed. And so you definitely have this sense of, wow, like <laughs> I am out in space and I'm falling around the earth in this controlled low earth orbit. Um, so I wouldn't call it really like fear or being scared, but it's sort of just this like heightened level of awareness that everything you do really matters and has high consequences. Um, so you, we definitely <laughs> pay attention to what we're doing when we're doing operations like that. Who inspired you to become an astronaut? A bunch of people actually inspired me and were part of my dream of becoming an astronaut. Um, the first time it really occurred to me, I would say my first role model was another Naval Academy graduate named Kay Heyer, who was an astronaut during the shuttle era. Um, my conversation with her, I just met her at an event at the Naval Academy and I'd never spoken to an astronaut before and got to talking with her about her stories from her shuttle missions. Um, and that was the first time it occurred to me how similar it was to working on a submarine and that I felt inspired that it might be something I could actually do myself. Um, but I would say along the way, I was inspired by all of my, by my parents my sisters, my coaches, my mentors, my friends, all people who really believed in me and believed I could do anything I set my mind to. Um, if I really dreamed big and, you know, pursued those dreams and put myself out there, took risks. Do you believe that there is life on the moon? 
You know, I don't think there is life on the moon. I, we don't think that, we do know there's water on the moon. There's water ice on the moon. Um, but I don't think that the moon has ever really supported life. Um, Mars is a different and very interesting question. A lot of scientists believe that there could have been simple life one at one time on Mars, maybe single celled organisms, um, that the conditions there sometime may have supported life. Um, but I, for now, we're just going to learn from rocks <laughs> on the moon, do a lot of interesting geology studies. Uh, but on Mars, that's one of the things our rovers are looking for. Um, our robotic rovers and eventually human missions will look for is trying to understand if all of the building blocks to support life exist or existed at one point on Mars. And we'll try to see if we can see any evidence that life at one time was there. Hi there. Um, I was wondering about the Houston and the Florida facilities and how much time you spend in both of them, please. Yeah, so the astronaut corps is actually based primarily in Houston. We all live and work there for the majority of our careers. Uh, when we're assigned to a mission, though, we're probably away from Houston about 50% of the time. Um, we train, you know, I just spent a lot of time at SpaceX in Hawthorne, California. There are facilities there because I launched aboard a SpaceX vehicle along with my crew. Um, I visited all of our international partner agencies to learn about their space station systems. Um, and then we also made trips to Kennedy Space Center in Florida, where we, we would be launching from to understand all of the launch systems and prepare for launch. Um, so we're based in Houston, but we're traveling all over the place in order to prepare for our missions. Is there any material or object heavy, heavy enough to not float away in space? So in space, we, we call it sort of apparent microgravity. It's sort of this perceived weightlessness. But what's really interesting is we still have mass. Uh, so basically, it's kind of a hard thing to understand. But the reason things feel heavy on Earth is because gravity is acting on them. Gravity is acting on us when we're in orbit around the Earth, too, or else we wouldn't stay in orbit. So where gravity is actually pulling us so that we don't fly away from the earth. It's pulling us in a circular orbit around the planet. And so it's a lot like being in free fall. If you've ever seen a video of people skydiving where it looks like they're flying, um, everything is falling at the same rate around the earth. And so it looks like, and we feel like we are weightless, but really we are still managing our own mass and also the mass of any objects we have. So anything that you have in space, depending on how massive it is, it takes more force or more energy to get it in motion. But once things are in motion, they're gonna continue in that direction at that speed unless they're acted upon by an outside force. So there's basically nothing that's too heavy to move around in space. When I was out on one of my spacewalks, I had a bag full of all of these big, metal struts. We were building a new structure outside the space station. And on Earth, it would have weighed 750 pounds. My suit on Earth would weigh 350 pounds. And then, of course, my own body weight. But I was able to carry and control that much. I would never, of course, be able to control that much weight or carry it on my own on Earth. But in space, I was able to manage it very carefully by moving slowly uh, around the space station but it's a lot harder to manage large and heavy or massive objects uh, in space because they have more inertia and more mass. Why did you want to be an astronaut? I wanted to be an astronaut because I wanted to be part of the incredible team at NASA. Um, ever since I was a kid, like I mentioned, I was interested in service and in understanding how what I would do with my career and my education would make the world better, a better place for others. And so when I realized the incredible work that we were doing at NASA, I really just wanted to be a part of that team, contributing to these really big challenges and making these really big discoveries on, on behalf of the planet. Um, so that's what inspired me to want to apply. And I was just really lucky that I got selected and I get to serve in this awesome role. Amazing, what a, a fantastic final question. So I think that's all uh, that Kayla has time for, unfortunately. Um, 
I can't even imagine how busy you are as part of this program. So I think I speak for everyone here when I say we really, really appreciate you um, giving up an hour of your time to answer some questions here. It's been wonderful having you. Thank you. It's been an honor to be with you. Enjoy the rest of the festival.